Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all here. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Carl Lestrito. Still getting to know some of you. I'm the director of the School of Architecture. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of Dean Jason Young and the College of Architecture and Design Programming Committee, whose members are Christopher Coate, Julie Kress, Scotty McDaniel, and Mark Stanley, who's the chair. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Maged Gerges, our colleague, on the occasion of his application for tenure. Um, because of this unique situation, I want to give a little bit of context. Um, the tradition of inviting our colleagues who are applying to tenure for tenure to give a lecture um, is, is something special here. Uh, it was new to me. Um, I think it's uh, a very healthy, um, kind of warm, important, celebratory moment, moment, in part because the tenure process itself happens largely in private. Um, so this is a moment where we have the opportunity to celebrate what is really a meaningful accomplishment, um, having the materials and the experience to apply for tenure itself. For students who might be new to the world of academia, let me just say what tenure is, because it's one of those things that is easily misunderstood. Um, when one applies to the tenure track, they're on what's called a probationary period. And during that time, it's basically on them to prove their contribution to the institution. And the award of tenure is where their balance switches. Um, often it's called the transition to the presumption of a lifetime appointment to the institution. It's a moment that is a gateway, yes, but it's also a moment that often sees one's career uh, really changing gears um, because the, the tenure allows one to think about a much longer term projects, to have total intellectual um, autonomy, to be critical, even critical of one's own uh, institution. Um, so uh, it's also a reminder uh, in my role as director looking, you know, kind of shepherding this process, um, how much that being a faculty member on tenure track or uh, tenured is, a, is an obligation of service. Service to students, service to the school community, um, service to communities in the state and beyond, and service to the discipline. Maged earned his Bachelor of Architecture degree at Helwan University in Egypt. After then earning a Master of Architecture at the University of Illinois, Chicago, he worked at Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill in Chicago. At SOM, Maged made a significant impact on a range of project types and scales, as well as the design process, specifically with regards to the use of computational methods to, to achieve sustainable and high-performance designs. Along with his colleagues at SOM, Maged made significant research contributions with respect to additive manufacturing and integrative approaches to engineering and architecture. In 2013, Maged received the SOM Foundation Research and Travel Fellowship, a very prestigious award which saw him further advancing that research while honing his individual trajectory with respect to computational design. Looking back at his early research career, we can see something that is just as true then as it is today. Maged is an intense disciplinarian. Um, you should not take that quote out of context. It can sound a little weird. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I do think it's worth dwelling on for a minute um, because the role of disciplinarity and discipline uh, is something that is important and unique to Maged. Okay, so the Latin inter means between or among, the idea that you're in the kind of Venn diagram middle. Um, but inter also can mean a kind of like erosion of the center, right? So Maged, I notice, doesn't use the word interdisciplinary that much, and I think it's not one that describes his research very well. Transdisciplinary is a very cool term. Um, the Latin trans means to kind of move through or across, kind of like the way like a tourist might touch on a discipline, take something from it, and move on. Also doesn't really apply. Um, being non-disciplinary is also kind of in vogue, the idea that one's creative practice is so unique and special and is so free that they don't align with any discipline. They, they reject it wholeheartedly, which is also a position that for those of us in architecture doesn't really sit well for us. 
Um, Maged most often uses multidisciplinary, um, and I think that's good. Um, but as director giving this lecture, um, I don't think that also really is the best, most perfect term, um, because Maged is firmly rooted in the discipline of architecture, so multidisciplinary, yes, but anchored very specifically in architecture. So I'm going to invent a term, um, breaking the syntax rules of Latin as a kind of pseudo-disciplinary practice. Uh, I don't speak Latin. The good thing about kind of discourse around Latin is very few people will tell you you're wrong. Um, so, but I do know from my Google searching and Google translating that there's the Latin um, imperatio. And imperatio means to share, impart, or present with. So if we call Maged an imperatio disciplinarian, um, it means that we're describing someone that travels between and among disciplines not to be like a tourist and to extract, but to be a kind of ambassador. Although as though the disciplines that Maged engages, engineering, biology, biochemistry, differential geometry, discrete mathematics, and robotics are all cultures with practices, methods, knowledge, that is not easily extracted, but meaningfully impacts the built environment, not despite, but because we have architects like Maged firmly committed to and citizens of the discipline of architecture. So now back on track to the story of Maged being here. Um, he joined UT first as professor of practice and as principal investigator of the Additive Manufacturing Integrated Energy Research Project known as AMI. This saw him collaborate with Oak Ridge National Laboratory on large-scale additive manufacturing um, with a focus on architectural applications, specifically experimental building envelopes, which were the first 3D printed energy efficient structures using big area additive manufacturing, also known as the first BAM, um, the first and best BAM, inside joke for some of us. Um, in 2017, he returned to UT as an assistant professor and on tenure track of design and structural technology. This is the position that has led us all being in this room right now. That, that position also enabled Maged to establish his practice, Soft Boundaries Lab, which regularly involves students as collaborators in the exploration of high performance building design. The website of the firm uses the first person plural to describe endeavors undertaken by we and us. I know that we and us is a lot of you in this room. Um, he publishes and teaches on, uh, publishes on teaching methodologies, manufacturing techniques, and novel structural innovations only possible due to the creative confluence of computational design and material science in journals devoted to structures, architectural mathematics, and manufacturing. He's also uh, author of a US patent for a technology that uses robotically controlled additive manufacturing and computational design platform to make 3D printing of large buildings practically and economically feasible. His lecturing, guest critic roles, and academic service have brought him to Iowa State University, Cornell, and the University of Illinois, Chicago. He regularly seeks opportunities for students beyond research with the aim of seeing them become engaged members of the community in tangible ways while promoting diversity. A proposal on these initiatives and goals was awarded the National ACSA Diversity Achievement Award in 2022. In 2021, he received the Chancellor's Excellence in Teaching Award. In 2019, he won the college's H. Patrick Lawson Faculty Teaching Award, and then won it again and again for three consecutive years in a row. In 2020, he became the McCarty Holsapel McCarty Endowed Professorship, which is an award for excellence in academic research and teaching. The American Institute of Architects National Innovation Award was also won by Maged, um, which was part of a technology educators at the College of Architecture Conference. There are also a slew of student awards that have been won because of Maged's mentorship, which are too many to list. But I do want to acknowledge and allow students 
um, to weigh in in some way on this introduction. So I went ahead um, and asked some of Maged's current students to weigh in, and I have some quotes here. I could, by the way, have gone into the course evaluations and used them alone to construct a beautiful narrative of teaching, but the premise there is that those are not for public dissemination. So um, I have a couple of anonymous, that was the premise, anonymous, anonymous student comments here that I want to read. The first one, Maged makes you want to design something amazing, then makes you believe you can, then patiently teaches until you actually do all the while encouraging you not to be stressed about it, but instead enjoy the process. Another quote. It is beyond evident how much he truly cares for the education of his students. His excitement about the class makes me genuinely excited to come, even if it's first thing in the morning. So we know what, that, what class that is from. Um, another quote. I've known him for only a month now, and he's already a mo role model to me, not just because of his accomplishments, but because I have never met someone who's phenomenally passionate about what he wants us to accomplish. Now it is my dream to be like him. <laughs> professor Maged is one of the greatest professors I've met, exclamation point. Every idea for him matters. He is really interested of what one of us wants He's really interested in what each one of us has to say and their thoughts, exclamation point. Um, even our hobbies and interests, exclamation point. I wish there were more people like him in this world, exclamation point. Um, uh, Maget is, obviously, a brilliant architect with a clear desire to equip us with practical skills we need to approach the working world with both resolve and creativity. It's evident that he is constantly learning and that he desires to share his own daily observations with us, which is one of the most exciting things about having him as a professor. He is engaging, efficient, and enthusiastic. All things I hope rub off on me. Exclamation point. So in conclusion, I do want to acknowledge while my role is to shepherd Maged's tenure process through um, this year, um, Dean Jason Young was formerly the director, and Scott Wall was the director during the important years of Maged's tenure track. So it's important to really note that I'm speaking on behalf of them, and Maged's success is owed much more to them and to you than to me. Um, there are also many other faculty who have contributed to Maged's success. So, uh, this, this role is only possible as a community. Um, so I also wanted to specifically acknowledge my colleague, Hans-Jörg Goritz, um, who served as Maged's official mentor and was the chair of the search committee um, that s led to Maged's hiring. Um, so I asked Hans-Jörg to give me a quote, and I will let that kind of take this lecture home. Um, okay. Um, quote, as the wonderful alt altruist and philanthropist we all know him for, Maged always inspires his students in class and on others' reviews with the words, I know you can do this, exclamation point. Rendering profound confidence compellingly simple and as a student's mentor. In essence, that is the authenticity that, embody, that he embodies so genuinely. Thanks, Hans Jörg. Thanks, Maged. Thanks, everybody. I'm done. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carl, for everything. Really, for even taking on, uh, taking the, the baton from uh, Scott Wall to make this process very seamless. I, it's it's very complicated, and a lot of things can can be uh, not that simple. Uh, but I truly appreciate that. Thank you for even putting together. I've never heard any introduction that longer. <laughs> like, and, 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 and that's, that's very thorough, thorough research about everything, the students, the faculty. I'm, I'm very humbled to, to, to hear that. Uh, I'm shaky, actually, because uh, I wish that was at the end, not the beginning. Now I have to, to, to present uh, what I'm having here. But thank you so much. Um, so. Um, because the introduction was very, very thorough, 
I'm gonna skip the first 20 uh, slides, okay? <laughs> and I'm not gonna do that. But maybe we can fly through them. Um, so the cover, it's, it's very, very difficult to pick a cover of things, right? And there is a complexity of working with the graphics. And the, I don't say this actually worked well because I want it without any image, but the, the image is very captivating. It's actually just an example of what I'm gonna be talking about for the next uh, hour or so. Is that, uh, can anybody realize or guess what is that? Okay, no students can answer because <laughs> that's actually, uh, that's a very famous image of that if you have taken any of my technology courses, whether undergrad or graduate structures, which is a very, very uh, uh, loving and, and uh, close to hearts uh, subject for students, not, <laughs> right? Uh, but this is a tensile structure and these are actually the flow of forces within a tensile structure. Nobody ever in the history thought about doing that. And uh, when I did this image, I thought it's really captivating. Actually, forces could be a beautiful thing. You can actually zoom in on it. You can make some work of art of it. There are two colors. We're going to get into that later because actually the last project I'm going to present is basically uh, working with these. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information for every section we're going to be talking about. Uh, this is just about the image. So this is tense size structure, which is tense, right? Just a simple tense, like a circus tense. And this is how the forces flow within the stress when you pull these tents apart, right? Um, okay. A, I tried to summarize the past five years uh, in slides. So if you give 10 slides for every year, how much do you have? About 50 slides, right? But I feel that's still out of context, right? Um, because what shaped me, what formed the way I am today is not really the past five years. It's actually past 20 years when I graduated from undergrad. So I put a couple slides of one day I was a student too, believe it or not. Uh, I, I started in 1997, I think, and then I graduated in 1996, and I graduated in 2001. So I took one project from 2001. That's about 21 years ago. It, take, it takes a year to work on that project, so about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there were no tools. My, my, my education was based on the Beaux-Arts. That's a French word for like the beautiful art, uh, which is very, very old curriculum. And then, um, we will draw, every, draw everything by hand. So for five year undergrad, similar to what you guys doing, uh, I was drawing everything by hand until I started to look at some pictures of books and photocopy of books of Norman Foster, Skidmore Owens in Maryland, uh, KPF and you name them. And I noticed they don't draw by hand. So hand is not gonna get me very far. It's very good to, to start with it, but for the complexity of the project that I wanted, it was not enough. So. So this is actually my senior project that was done 20 years ago with AutoCAD and a software called Lightscape. Which all of these are discontinued except me for AutoCAD. So you see a lot of history here. Like think about ancient Egyptians, so you, the temple of architecture that like used to draw. This is, but still, um, just I was asking some of my students, you need to do some schemes. And ask, someone asked me, what does a scheme mean? A scheme is like an option for design. Uh, and I said, can you do at least three? I did 64 different ones for that one, <laughs> right? So three w seems a lot to them, but it's actually not. Um, <laughs> so um, this is, it seems like from day one, I have drawn to some sort of like a structure expression, even though I never thought one day I'm gonna be teaching structure. Structure are a very difficult topic. The way I learned it, I had a whole semester of steel, a whole semester of concrete, a whole semester of soil, and don't let me start on soil, okay? Um, so this project was a hypothetical Olympics of arena uh, in, in, in Cairo, and the front part of it, it took me about two weeks to model, which now probably in Rhino can do it in one minute, right, or three minutes maybe. Um, so fast forward, uh, 13 years later, uh, I went to graduate school, and this is the first project I designed at graduate school. Um, um, the reason why I choose my graduate school because I understand the topics they were talking about. Like there was a, 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 a class called uh, logistics. I didn't even know what the word logistic means. So I would pick that class because probably I'm gonna learn something out of it because it's worth my $5,000, right, for that class. So this project is, is 
not only try to wrap the city within the city, make a, it's a million square foot. So imagine your first assignment at school, you design a million square foot building. Um, and then I took it even at a little bit to the next level where I start actually modeling the detail of that later on. So fast forward a little bit more. Uh, after graduation, I start working uh, similar what Connor mentioned for Skidmore, Owing and Merrill. So this is, I'm gonna fly through some projects that um, what I used to do from nine to five, and sometimes nine to five the next day, and sometimes nine to five the day later, and sometimes nine to five three days later. And that's true. Like one time I worked in a competition when I went to work at, uh, on, on Friday morning, and I went back home, and Sunday night my daughter was born on Monday of that week. <laughs> so, and then the day later I got an email are you going to come back to finish that competition or what's going to happen? You can't do anything wi without you. We're not here. So it's, it's really fun. <laughs> um, so this is the first project I've ever designed at SOM. So after, I practiced for 10 years, but the first project was, Um, yeah, so the first project you ever worked on, you gave, I say you're going to give me a, a, a small tower, a, a little bit of a, maybe a lobby desk, maybe a stair, right? You said, no, you're going to design a whole downtown, right? That's it. Just call it a day and you're going to do it. And it was a competition. We won the competition. And um, when someone said, I work for a big firm, and you led the design of a project, they don't really understand the magnitude of what you're doing. Like, are you actually drawing the project? Are you actually sketching something, right? It's actually everything. It starts by sketching, modeling the volumes, modeling the skin. For these, some of them, even rendering them when you, the project doesn't have a budget, like I'll show you some of them, uh, and write the competition brief, write the book, and submit it. And no matter what your level, you're involved in all of them including the, the detailed drawings to make things work, right? Jacob here might speak for that. <laughs> so, um, so more of that, so the idea here is that I wanted to create, um, scripting was involved in this, so it's calculating the, actually the traveling distance of these people, and it will create a bridge, and then we throw in a museum there, um, and it's under construction now. So fast forward, I become like, um, uh, the senior designer, so I take, start taking bigger project, but in more detail. So this is actually under construction. When it's done, it's going to be the world tallest offset core tower in the world. Uh, and the reason why is that is that all the skyscraper has the core in the middle. It's a mi very big part of the structure, but when you take it out, you open the floor. But then the structure, you said we're going to have still four columns coming down in the lobby. But I said no, we can transfer the, the load. And then this is what he, and they say, okay, we're going to have a massive I-beam channels that's sticking out, but it's at an angle. I said, that's my problem then. I'll make something nice out of them. And that's where the idea of these cladding happened. Actually, these cladding are all in pure compression. So each one is actually supporting the load be below it. Um, this is 20 uh, stories tall. So these people can have like a concert at night. Um, we can, you can find more uh, details about this project. I want to get to the, the real deal. So this is another one, it's another offset core, it's not as tall. That was in Sydney, and it's gonna come back in the slides because it's logically optimized. It's okay if you don't understand what does it term, it's the whole lectures about it today. So um, another one in Makati, Philippines. Majority of these actually, they're newer pictures, so they're, a lot of them are already done. They're already topped out. Uh, so the, this is the last, one of the last project. I worked in that project while I was working in the Amy project. Uh, in addition to the one previous to it. Uh, so this is, in, this is actually uh, only 19 stories, but it's a skyscraper in Fargo, North Dakota. You can tell that because the tallest building is like two stories, right, or three stories. Uh, it has everything, so it has uh, a hotel, it has a, an office spaces, and it have a loft, and then the, actually the governor takes the top penthouse. Um, so a lot of these, um, a lot of these experiences start to form the way I approach things, the way I teach things, the way I wanted to uh, approach also my research. So in teaching, 
I started this series called Extraordinary Methods in Architecture. Uh, I noticed from the 15 years of my practice, uh, architecture has to be spectacular, that your design has to be insanely spectacular, because by the time it's actually be detailed and actually be uh, constructed, you're gonna lose a little bit of the quality of your design. So you start with a good design, you end up with garbage. But if you start with a spectacular, maybe you end up with an excellent design or something really impressive, right? So um, the series is only taking one topic, and it's influenced by different branches of sciences in my lab. So we'll talk a little bit about differential geometry, what does that even mean, and, and, and things like that. But before getting into design, the whole reason I was brought here, the job actually I was submitting to come here is actually the structural technology position which I've never taught structures before, but in my practice, I've always heavily involved with structure engineers. Not regular structure engineers, structure engineers who actually can invent things. Um, like an SOM, it was very famous when Nathaniel, and these are first names of SOM, by the way. So <laughs> in the 1937, they came together to start a firm. They said, we're gonna put structure engineers, we're gonna put architects, and then later on, they brought all the discipline. The reason is that is that there is no uh, like fiddling between, oh, I can't do that. They're all working together for the success of the project. And this is what I got taste of. So I thought, um, a nice story. So I was used to come here visiting as a visiting professor, and I was sitting in one of the integration projects uh, reviews. And then I noticed that the, the students were really very excited that they figured out the sprinkler system, the lighting, everything, but the, the half of this, the review didn't really focus on the design. And then the structure was like very timid. Like I said, you have no client, no money. This is the time where you actually do what you dream to do, right? Like you can really do amazing thing with the structure if you want. But, um, and when you're a student, when you're in college, when you're in school, that's the time to experience that. Other than that, that value engineering is gonna shut down most of your dreams, but at least do it now, right? <laughs> so. When I was little, when I was younger, high middle school, there was a series of, of novels in Egypt called The Impossible Man. The Impossible Man is supposed to be someone who can ride all kind of aircraft cars. He speaks seven languages, and he can know all the martial arts, and he can have disguise. I'm, it's like a secret agent, right? So when I took the job, I thought, I want to be do the impossible architect. So what are the skills? Oh, that impossible man, his father taught him all this when he was like two years old and four years. Every time he grew something, he would teach him like lots of lots of things, right? So if I want to do an impossible architect, I need to train the students for the way that we practice in real life, but not a normal practice. It's a state-of-the-art practice, things that they will never dream to access to. And it's easy because if you want to teach structures, just let them see it. Let's just them visualize it. And I start searching around for tools that allows them to do that. Like in the first two lectures of my structure courses, we're talking about theory, like forces and loads. And the forces and the loads are the same. It's just different names and reactions. And it's very abstract. Imagine if we're continuing for four months just talking about theory, and you can't really apply anything to it. So the the idea here now, if I'm asking you that when you change the force's direction, the resultant, the total of the forces also changes, but if you can see it happening, hopefully you understand it a little bit better. By the same token, hopefully if you had Marlene's class, you know what shear moment diagrams, right? But if you, if you actually can experiment what happens when the distributed load creates a parabola in your moment diagram, and also what happens if your steel beam carrying all the load but then if you change it to concrete and wood, they start to become like ramen noodles. You understand that, you know that wood is weaker than steel, but aluminum, for example, is a very strong material. It actually behaves really well. So hopefully that will let the students understand a little bit the behavior of the structure system. So the dream of only analyzing a simple beam, it grows bigger from here. But I still don't lose track or the idea or the importance of manual calculation. So they still have to calculate the reactions by hand and then by the computer, they can figure out multiple of these. The same thing with trusses. Uh, you can see how the truss behaves based on section. How can you optimize a truss by selecting different members based how much stress it goes through? 
Not only this, when you do later when we talk about the topology optimization, all these trusses span the same thing, but just by changing the geometry, who's the best performance truss here? Can you be a 10? Anyone who took last semester? <laughs> it's okay, you can say. <laughs> the crescent truss, right? So you would never, you would never guess that. Well, why is it why is not the boho truss? Why is not the boat train? The crescent truss actually reduced the material almost 30% and also have the same span. But we can kick it up a notch. We started actually optimizing every, using the evolutionary solver, optimizing every member, and then try to translate that to a pasta strand. Like if you have a very thick member that has so much stress, you put five pastas. And then if you have a very thin member that doesn't have any stress, just one pasta. And we made an international competition within our school. It's not really international. That we made up our own awards. 99% of the awards are made up, like this one. So, uh, so uh, the students will start to, for example, that was one of the winners. It's not the heaviest truss, uh, I mean, sorry, bridge, but it's the one that actually carries 20 times more its own weight. Even the International Olympics for Pasta Bridge, they can't do that because they're, they just build things, they just make it robust. Um, and then they designed the award, and I will give them the award, it will be fun, right? Um, so now the dream of a student to be able just to model a beam, now we can analyze a 600 a truss with 600 members and I can point at any member and say how much the internal stress in this member and they will tell you. Not only this, you will see that actually affecting the way they model and the design inside their studio, especially if they come back to my studio, because in the other studio, you say, no, we didn't take structures. It's been, we didn't take anything with Marlene. We didn't take anything with Magid. We, haven't, we don't know what column is. Is that the one in the newspaper, right? <laughs> Wait, that's carrying the title because the title has heavy load on it, right? So anyway, so with, 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 uh, with the... Um, form active system or tensile structure, they can actually simulate the tensile membrane. They can also test it by hand. But then the, the COVID hit and I needed to figure out a way to have an 80 student be able to understand what we're doing, especially scripting. I tend to be very fast. So I had a dream that we should do manual calculation, computation design, and then physical model testing, like crashing the bridge. In architecture model, you you baby them, you don't want to break them, but in structure, you want to see them fail because that's going to protect you later, right? So I, I made modules where the students can, I still give live lectures, but the students can actually watch the scripting. And then the problem is that all of them start to get 100% because they actually can pause and go back. So everybody gets the assignments correctly. So it seems it worked. So the, the second half in our graduate course in particular, we switch gear from traditional structure courses to research. So during my fellowship, I traveled to ATI, I traveled to Stuttgart, actually where I met Marshall for the first time. We never know that we're gonna come back and meet again here. So I start looking at top labs, people doing PhD in structure engineering. What do they do, right? And we take each one of them and pick a uh, topic. This is actually a grid shell uh, structure and the other image here that's showing an augmented reality of the analy analyzed forces within the model. This is a reinforced, uh, unreinforced compression only geometry with vernacular form or vaults. Um, and that's pretty much it. So now, design. So that's the studio. So the studio, I started by pushing this idea of the extraordinary methods in design or in architecture and then pair it with a, a, an initiative called Reinvision Knoxville. If you're a good designer, why not taking all the abandoned sites in Knoxville and take it one at a time and push the potential of it? But we're not designing just for a next mixed use building, we're designing for spectacular architecture, right? So can we design a building with people driving by but they don't have kids going to UT, we'll say we're not gonna go to Nashville right away, we'll stop by Knoxville to see that building, right? It happened before, right? It happened to Bilbao. It's actually an architecture theory that's the Bilbao effect. If you go to Spain, you have a couple of days, you either go to Barcelona, you have more time, you go to Madrid, but you'll never go to Bilbao, right? But after Frank Gehry did the Bilbao Museum, Guggenheim, right? People go there and actually, uh, like Philip Johnson went there and he was crying when he saw the building and haven't seen the building for years, maybe I'm gonna cry now, but we'll see. 
so the, the idea here is that we have the opportunity to rechange the city, to re actually really make an impact, maybe one abandoned lot at a time. So the idea here is that we started by this studio called uh, the Super Habitat. We tried to think about how can we make a net zero sustainable 3D printed community. And it was in Oak Ridge. We, we took an abandoned site that was industrial and it was rezoned for residential. Um, that was my first time to teach actually second year undergrad. I used to teach second year graduate in that semester, but then they wanted to see if I still can teach undergrad and see what's going to happen with them, right? Uh, like more organized uh, course. So we did the whole master plan, and they, they said, we haven't done this before. I told them, it's OK. I've done it a million times. Let's just do it again together. And uh, not only this, there was no roads. So we designed the roads. The roads were named after the last name of their students, because where are we getting the last name from? We don't know really, right? So each one will name a road and take a lot and design 99 prototypes. How can you do that on second year undergrad, right? So it was the help of my wife, actually. She's a genetic engineer and biologist and robotist and, uh, and molecular geneticist. And then I thought, OK, we can, oh, this is a fun one. So in my studies, we always create some sort of games. So this is a game card that when you play it, after 15 minutes, you learn everything about Oak Ridge. So um, we use genetics. And she came and she gave a lecture about phenotype, genotype, and how genetics happen in biology. And we took the same terms and we start scripting how does that happen and actually geometrically in architecture. So we start with a prototype that actually works. And we start making one modification at a time. And then we start cross-pollinate these modifications. So we end up with one, not one geometry. Each student had 30, multiply that until each one got 90 prototype. And then we pick one prototype and then detail it. And that's what he did. Um, so that's what this is the, I think that's generation 40, 35 or, yeah, generation 36. So back to my lab, a few years ago, one of the topics that I was researching in Vienna in particular to the uh, Technical Institute of Vienna was Helmut Putman. Helmut Putman is like the Einstein of mathematics, especially ge architecture, geometry, mathematics. He wrote, he co-authored the architecture geometry book. It's about 2,000 pages. You should check it out. Um, and I was fascinated about that there is actually a field in mathematics. We use it all the time, but we have no clue how is it done, which is basically is the mathematics of surfaces. When you model something in Rhino, Rhino goes through equations and create a surface out of the curve that you drew, but you don't know how it's done. So there's a way actually you write the equation and the surface will be generated, which you can create surfaces beyond the traditional means, like very complex continuous surface, especially something called um, um, in terms of surface, you have the developable surface and undevelopable surfaces, but also you have uh, the, um, it will come to me. So the idea here, I made studios that only look at one modification only, the whole studio. So for example, if we're talking about the Boolean, which is on and off, zero, one, right? To Boolean subtract only. And then we start looking how that, it's done in contemporary design practices. So for example, this is Zakunji, uh, theater by Toyo Iro. Majority, majority of the time, it can prescribe, uh, uh, like if you can tell the difference between that theater from the surrounding context, it's actually, you see the end result. You never see how it was created. So we use scripting and computation design to reverse engineer to understand, like one of these animations, you'll notice how big the cone that was used to subtract one of them. I think the last one at the end. So we started analyzing. If you have 15 students, we analyze 15 case studies. But we model them. We script them. We understand how it works. Another concept for Boolean is that it could actually create an interior spaces. So you just start with a simple mass. But then the, the interior spaces with the intersection of the volume start creating. This is actually the, the polygram theater by Tadu Andu. And then now the students become expertise in these techniques, and they start designing their own and see if they're going to live up to these star architects, right? So this is actually, if you know, this is Gay Street. This is Cumberland. This is the, park, the famous uh, parking lot that we always uh, see with the, uh, so we thought how we make uh, a Knoxville Grand Theater. 
But then I fall into a trick. Now, how can I teach about designing theater without knowing anything about acoustics, right? So we'll make a music hall. Let's give them a crash course about acoustics. So we learn acoustics and learn how to simulate. This is the sound source and the verbation time and all the tricks that you need to know that this is acoustically well designed. And this is a rendering of it. In my studies, we don't have textbook. We create our own textbook. This is a 400 pages. It's ha it reproduced right before the mid-review. becomes their actual textbook that they can use for referencing. Because there is not a single book about Boolean, subtract, within architecture practice that design theaters. There's nothing like that. So we create our own, right? The second geometrical move that we did with the twists. So you can't be at SOM or, and not teach a course about skyscrapers, right? But that would be too easy, right? So how about why we not design a non-orthogonal skyscraper and how is that affecting the performance of the building? So these are 15 structure models that's in the first week. They're built in the first week out of chipboard. Just try to understand the engineering side of a skyscraper before designing the architecture part of it. So there's no architecture involved here, just a core, column, slabs. And how it's modeled, it's modeled out of two curves. And, and the idea here is that the, you know that no matter how complex the geometry is, if you script it in a proper way, you can make very, very highly complicated structure systems. A lot of these, they can have up, up to 30% steel reduction just because reducing the load of the uh, wind load on the building by adding a little twist to it. We tested it in the in three projects at SOM, obviously the most famous one, the one in Dubai, um, the uh, uh, Marina Tower. So for this one, this is actually some of the, the, these students were third year undergrad. They never designed a single skyscraper in their lives. And they were super excited to do that. And actually two projects from the first studio were finalists in an international competition by the CBTUH, which is the, the tall building. Uh, it's not against schools in the United States. It's schools against the world, like Japan, any, uh, Germany. Italy, everywhere, and they were both a short list of two projects from this one. That brought me to the last uh, project, which I worked on it prior to COVID, and when COVID hit, it was really good time to test out this, this class, because we were working half week remotely, half week on, uh, uh, on, on class, on site. And that helped that we were communicating with people in Mozambique, and the directors of this, the school, the Halawika school, online uh, to get input from them. The idea is that th f three years ago, I had an opportunity to meet with Sybil here in Knoxville, and um, I learned about their school. What happened is that they always get hit by cyclones, and then you keep repeating building the same exact method. And I thought, can we help? We have no money. We can't really give them money at this point, but can we help them with our things that we know, it's just design, right? So tell us what you have, and then we'll challenge our design abilities. It's very easy to work for a firm to design a $3 million canopy for a $3 billion tower. That's easy, somewhat. <laughs> but the difficult part is that when you work on the world third poorest country in the world, when you only have CMU, very, very limited access to material, can design still be powerful? Can it actually work? Can you make something that more resilient or not even better that can withstand the, the, the continuous attack by the cyclones? So similar to all the other projects, that was a really tough one because I've never designed anything like that before. I never designed anything that scale before. The smallest building I've ever designed was Amy. And even though it was the smallest object I designed, it made the massive impact on my career. It's actually brought me here, right? So we start also making our textbook. It was a massive textbook. We also, similar to the playing card, we made a construction card for the local workers, for the best practices. If you're using CMU, this is how you should construct it. And it doesn't even, even if you don't know how to read English, it's like you're making an IKEA model, just step one. Even though IKEA, I'm not a big fan of the idea of the, the, <laughs> the, the, the steps in it, but just to understand, it's just basically follow these steps and this is the best construction method within your uh, material that, palette that you have. So we did a master plan, multiple ones really actually, 
uh, for the vision of what the school. So now if you have, they have money, they can build the first class, and then they have more funding, they know where the second class is. Prior to that, they used to design on Word, Microsoft Word, just drawing a rectangle, and, this is the, and then whenever they have more funding, we can do the second one. So now it becomes more, have a vision of, we even had swimming pools, basketball courts, even though we might not have, they might not have funding for that. Not only this, we in introduced ways of active learning where the furniture can be arrayed in a different ways based on the, the, the method or the class that's been taught this time. Um, so these are the images. This is by Kristen Pitts, which just happened to be also my research assistant all the time she was here. And then finally that will get us to part two, which is actually we're starting the lecture. <laughs> So that's the research part. So what is um, similar to what uh, Carl was talking about, the, the soft boundaries, how did it came about? It came about uh, when I was traveling. I noticed that there is a series of really fascinating solution, design solution that can be ported or implemented from other sciences. So I had about 12 different topics when I traveled, like when I would do research for two years, like so you have cell biology, biochemistry, nanorobotics and, and um, differential geometry, discrete mathematics. And then I started saying, okay, so let's, let's, let's make a, a lab and also a firm that try to implement these ideas or these principles that try to solve architecture uh, issues. So the current research, and, uh, we have about six projects going on now in the lab. But in the majority of them trying to produce high performance design. That could be in the scale of a building, that could be a scale of a, a module, like a wall, that could be a scale of a chair, it could be a scale of an object, like a, a small object, like a product design. But I want to not digress, but this is what I do in my spare time, which I have a lot of spare time, obviously, right? <laughs> so I draw twice a year, Some, one time in the summer. And the biggest one actually happens always in Christmas. I have some drawings that can I started, and five years later I haven't done with it yet because it's every Christmas. So I love birds. I travel to watch them. I sketch them. I draw them. Like this is actually a digital sketch. All these are with colored pencils. Uh, there's something fascinating about birds that we can learn so much from them, especially the efficiency of how they use their body weight and their body structure. They're actually similar principle that we're using in the lab. They're trying to do that they have to use the optimal strength to weight. They need the skeleton to be very strong but super light so they can fly. In our case, we need things to be super strong but super light to reduce material. So can I learn from the structure of a, a starling skull, for example, to reduce 40% of material in structure? Can we do that? You think we can? We'll see. So these are some colored ones. Uh, this one took about, I don't know, three months. Uh, my son actually draws too. He can finish these like in 20 minutes. We, so he can finish this whole lecture in one uh, third of my time. So the first project that I want to talk about today, I call it the U House. The U House came from the, you can call it the ultimate house, that U House, that you are the one who actually can be, be able to assemble it. So the idea is that, um, the current con construction methods, uh, this is a really nice pie. The yellow one is about 41%. This is actually waste from just construction of wood. If I can see the little ones, like for example, drywalls are doing very well. It's only 1%. So you, the, the Environmental Protection Agency in 2015, there was about half million ton of waste coming from construction, right? So you use your two by four, you measure, you trim, throw this away and keep trimming, right? 41%, uh, almost half of it comes from wood. So we waste a lot of wood. The reason is that is that now, majority of construction methods are subtractive, which they require removal of material uh, by trimming, milling, in order to produce final usable parts. So the drawing on the, or the image on the left, this is in 1877, and the one on the right is about 2019. So it's almost, um, like almost, uh, almost 140 years with nothing major changes. Why is that? Because that system works. It's amazing, right? It doesn't even need a structural engineer. It doesn't need an architect. It just puts 16 inch on center, right? It's based on the redundancy. 
if we remove one of these, that's okay. If we need to open a window next to that window, it's still okay, right? So, and also when you want to hang your, your, your uh, heavy mirror, you can find the first stud and then the next one and then you can just hang it on it, right? If we compare that to, um, um, to this is, it's called lightweight or stick build structure, but if we think timber, you can remove all these and only have columns at the end. That will require a little bit more carefulness and the joint, the connection, you use way less material, but if you lose that column, you lose the whole building, right? So on the other hand, this is actually uh, 3D printing, I think it's 15 hours, but shrunk into 30 seconds of one of the Amy's 3D printed. So the idea here, the whole reason that the whole main concept of Amy is that I wanted to combine, I was flying actually uh, back to Chicago, and then I read an article about Boeing where they 3D printed and part of an engine that has 100 parts, but they 3D printed at one piece that can be assembled as by itself coming out of the printer. So I thought, we have that in architecture, right? We have a wall that can have so many, many pieces. So then I start really approaching the project in two different ways. I say, how about we include the structure, the exterior wall, the interior walls, the cavity, the conduit, the window framing, and maybe also we didn't want to print the glass. We couldn't print like acrylic, but we have Alcoa, so we had to keep them in partnership. So we have to use the glass, right? So um, this is actually Clayton Holmes. This is the assembled thing. So they put it on the normal uh, framing for houses, uh, for their mo uh, modular homes. And this is massive. This guy is six foot tall. And this is the size of the two rings coming together. I'm not going to talk more about it. It's, it's very well uh, documented. Um, but the idea is that. 3D printing of large component can happen, and, and we tested that even though we had no clue what we were doing back then, right? Because you have manual for steel, manual for concrete, manual for wood, but you don't know what does carbon fiber behave, right? So nobody wanted to sign on that building. Like, it's very big liability to do that. So that's why we had to keep it mobile. So topology optimization. What's that for layman terms? Topology optimization, the traditional method of it, is basically a computational form finding. It's the way the computer will find the form for you. So far, so good, right? And then also, it determines the best possible form based on the optimum material distribution, based on stresses. So let's say we have a mass that's full solid, like 100% solid. It will apply load and support, and that will tell me where the material needs to be based on the stress. If I can create somehow this material only, then I will have only the minimum requirements similar to the build, bird skeleton. That's not a new thing. It's, it's revolutionizing everything in the auto industry and the aircraft design. And I actually used it in one of our projects. So this is actually the first time we used topology optimization. This is a high-waisted uh, truss. Uh, it's called Mitchell truss. And this is the one that's covering that offset core tower. So the, the, um, this is the 100 Mount Street in Sydney. It's a very unique tower because if you put the core outside, it removes the stiffness from the middle of the tower. So you need to stiffen the other end as well. So that's when we optimize that wall. And the tower basically is a cantilever. You guys know that, right? It's a cantilever, but instead of being attached to Instead of being attached to a wall, like if you have a bracket on the wall, right? Instead of being attached to a wall, it's attached to the ground. So the same forces in this case will be the wind forces. So if I have here, it used to take weeks to create geometry like these, but now everything becomes super fast. Like now, if I move my finger here, that's the load. And that will tell me if I move that load, this is the geometry that wants to be. All the white part is solid. And then I only, to create this condition where I have the support here, if I take this and put it up here, rotate it this way. Sorry, I turned it off. It becomes the tower. So there's a nice, interesting thing about this project that the, gla the, the bathrooms in the core were not made of fire-rated concrete. They were made of fire-rated glass. Why is that? Because that's the view from the bathroom. So we didn't want to have, it's insanely expensive, but it was totally worth it. So you don't have a mirror, 
right? You don't have a mirror. You ha you're actually looking at the Oprah Sydney Harbor. And you can see Oprah Sydney all the way back there. I had to crop the edge. So what happens if we take a standard, your traditional home framing, and apply the same principles that we apply in the skyscraper, apply in the bird's geometry on your traditional uh, 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 framing? So this actually, what we got the first time. So the first one, you see how much material is happening. And on our first test, it was reduction up to between 40 to 36% of material. But the crazy part in that, there's no reason or rhyme to actually create a geometry like that. We can simplify it. We can standardize it similar to the airplane. But when you're modeling an airplane, it's worth it because it costs multi-million dollars, right? And you have mass production for it. But for a house without 3D printing to make that complex geometry, it's not really, it's counterproductive, right? So we want to kick it up a notch and you say, OK, that's nice. That's super fast. If you, you notice how much that was calculated. So how about we want to make it 3D? What was the full volume? And we give it a brief. I have this roof, and I have this foundation. Show me the forces flying through it 3D. This is just the first test. We didn't put rooms or anything. We just want to see how the flow of forces. What's nice about this, you can add actually volumes. We call them obstacles. And the, the, the algorithm will actually try to avoid them and create volumes for you. This has been used in, in, um, in Qatar, in one of the convention centers, but only in one slab. This is a 3D printed test. It was 3D printed actually upside down because it's actually like a growth geometry. So and we know it's supported. And here's the crazy part. This is uh, an electron microscope uh, micrograph of a starling star skull. Do you know starlings? They're black with yellow peak. They're not native to the United States. They were brought from England. So we have all the Shakespeare birds in here, which is obviously what happens. Happens that they're invasive species, right? Similar to what we do with everything. So the one on the left, this is actually, nobody 3D printed it. It's the birds figure out a way to make his skull super lightweight and still very strong. So the same biological principle, which has happened to be uh, that they both want to have the optimal weight to strength uh, that used in efficient use of resources. And that's the same method that algorithm is working to do the same thing. So that start thinking, OK, how can we design the ultimate panel, right? Like the U panel, the panel that you can actually can assemble yourself. So we started by optimizing the panel. And then we started thinking about, OK, now this is how can we translate this data into three-dimensional data. So this is a, a, a low polygon model that turns into a polygon nerves mesh. And then we actually took it and run finite element analysis again on it. And if you notice that the only stress is happening in the only joint is very, very minimal. And then not only this, when we used material for Amy, that was carbon fiber. It was not really the best material we can use with it. We can potentially use what used to be the waste, the wood waste. It can be wood chipped, and they can have to turn on PLA pellets. And that you can 3D print part for what used to be thrown away, the 40% 40, 40 the 500 tons of waste in the first slide. This is a, some diagram of the potential workflow of that, how it's going to be 3D printed, how it's going to be attached to a wall. And a nice, the nice thing also, we can actually also print the insulation. We can place, uh, there's so much progress happened since 2005 about what kind of pellets or what kind of 3D printing material we can use. You can insulate the structure now, which is a big deal when you have a steel column. This is a thermal bridging, right? When you have your structure always is a problem that's a different lecture when we talk about thermal. And <laughs> um, that here's another thing. In Amy, we had a two inch thick wall that has our value. The MAI panels in, in it, it was one inch. It has our value of 40. But the three printing layers are terrible, right? So we dropped about 34. But still, your biggest dream in normal construction, you have a foot of, of you get our value of 18, right? And uh, so it was a really breakthrough. These principle doesn't only work for large buildings, wall panels, homes. It also works with smaller prototypes. So this is loungy. If you remember the first slide with the principal stress line on the tensile membrane, this is actually the principal stresses from human body. Like when you sit on a chair, your head has a different weight than your back, than a different weight on the rest of your body. If you map that on a chair, these are the principal. This is actually your Vertoya chair, what it wanted to be, but they didn't know how to do it, right? 
and you can you can use the ISO curve, right? So the idea here is that you can optimize also how it's supported, and it creates these like almost like growth-like structure that basically for this the algorithm I give it three points at the bottom of the chair and ask it to grow what structure for the beneath the chair wants to be. Not only this, we can actually enforce the fabric of the chair with the same principal stresses. So when you sit on it and you want to, and it starts to go through stress, it's actually enforced with the areas that's most stressed because of the principal stress lines that's supporting it, right? So I'll have a little uh, video. Uh, let me see the, that's showing that. So it's, I think I hit escape for here. So I believe the work we're doing in our lab is trying to find ways for design that's driven by material economy and trying to find solutions for architects and designers that, uh, that they can have a more sustainable, more resilient, more res responsibilities toward how they approach design. And throughout the years, what I learned is that there is no really one easy answer to any problem. And I, we as designers, we actually create problems ourselves. And we have to figure out really how to solve it. And the, the impact that we can leave on the environment, we have a responsibility for that. That's why um, I believe the significance of what we're trying to do, not just in our lab, not just in our school, but also how we teach our students this responsibility. Um, this is the last thing that I have. I have one small thing uh, that I prepared for you, um, which basically I did it last Christmas. We went to a log cabin and I had no uh, paint material. I didn't have anything to paint with. And I was very, I had about four hours on my hand and I wanted to create that thing. So while I'm doing that, while you're watching what's going to happen, I'm going to thank the people who brought me to that point. So enjoy. So um, I would like to take a moment to thank, that forgive me for forgetting him, but I, I, I have some people who actually played a significant role uh, in getting to that point today. I would like to thank Dean Jason Young, even before he was a dean, when he was a director, that I spent most of my five years um, his genuine advice, his unwavering support. He, even from day one, I'm always the guy who came from Chicago, but he will never make me feel this way. And out of everybody, whenever he tells me something, I'll trust him 100%. I don't know why, but that's what I do. <laughs> so thank you very much. I also would like to thank Scott Poole, because he was also instrumental for bringing me here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, both Carl Lastrido and Scott Wall, especially when Scott was the director uh, and he handled the baton to, to Carl, and Carl took on it in addition to all the other responsibilities to make sure that this process goes very smoothly, even though we were throwing at, here's a new system called Interfill, you have to learn it and you have to actually use it. Uh, but they were, they were superly supportive they did everything in a beautiful way, and everything go went very smoothly. Obviously, I wouldn't be here without two people, Hanjor Gorges, right, and uh, um, TK Davis. Hanjor, from day one, even when I was interviewing, 
he actually, the first time he gave me a hug. Like, <laughs> why? I think that happened the first time I met him, right? And he, 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 we felt we already know each other years and years ago. And I keep telling that story. When I went through the pages, I said, if there's an architect like that in that school, that means I'm doing the right decision. I can also be in that school. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Gregor Callis. I'm going to try to remember everyone, but Gregor, um, in the past few years, he's always encouraging me, and he helped me tremendously in, in how we write things, how we submit things, how we uh, organize our thoughts. I'd like to thank Jennifer Ackerman for her coaching and tips and tricks of how to put together a tenure to see, even though they change everything now, but I still, <laughs> it's very helpful. Um, T.K. Da Davis, who took me for tours, and he gave me a beautiful uh, lunch with lobster that I think was out of his pocket. They were done with the trip, and he decided he's going to uh, treat me for that. Um, uh, Marlene, obviously, because like she always hand me the bouton. She trains the students really nicely in her classes, and I always visit all their classes. Um, Abigail, obviously, because we're always involved in the graduate school. It's not a walk in the park, but, but she's doing an amazing job. Um, Mark Decay, when we were working in, 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 in Mozambique, I had no clue what we're going to do with that project, how we can really push on, on the idea of passive design. And he was, out, this is the first time I saw him excited about a studio, to be honest, that we're working on. He would visit the studio, would be on the reviews. Obviously, all these people always in my reviews. I'm on the reviews, so that's, I can go on and on for the support. Um, Marshall Prado, obviously, because we, we started together. We taught all these classes at the beginning, and then each of us picked a class, the computational workflow, the structure course, and Ted Children, Ted Children used to teach modules with me in the structure courses as well. Uh, Catherine Ambrosiak for always supporting me uh, when things that we have no clue about, how you write a grant. There's a, there's a deadline for this one. This is how you, you, you should target this one, writing grants, how you form your research, reviewing applications, um, and, um, um, and so, so many, many more. Like Tim Dolan, he always smiles at me, and he always calls me by name. Like, I, that's really super nice. Uh, <laughs> um, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to thank more of, of these faculty, but actually, there are the invisible warrior, the people who works in the background that makes us all success, um, all the IT staff. I'm going to actually like to thank Florence Grave. I mean, she's not here now, but through my time, she, she's the one who might go to when it comes to finance. I have no clue what we're going to do. And she said, don't worry. If you want to go a trip, here's how we do it. If you want to do finance something, she's the, 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 the wizard in these things. So Peggy, Ma Peggy, Amber, Pamela, and Vanessa, and Tasha, uh, these, these actually, we rely on them heavily. They do a lot of amazing work for us. Without IT, I wouldn't be doing any of that stuff, right? So there is the super fast response from Jeff and Don. Uh, oh, my computer is swollen. Actually, one time, my touchpad swollen from putting too much pressure on my processor, right? And they will fix that in, a, in like in seconds. They say, oh, sorry. They say, no worries. And then uh, who else? Um, um, Brian Ambrosiak. Brian Ambrosiak actually, everybody felt, make me feel like I'm welcome. Brian Ambrosiak was the one who tried to convince me to go back to Chicago in the first week. No, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> no, Brian has been always supportive, and during the interview, I would get the most clearest answer from him. Like everybody trying to tell me Knoxville is the best country and best city in the world, but Brian told me, no, you should figure out where you're going to live, who are you going to take your kids, and I felt. He's going to be my go-to guy when I need the real deal of things, right? He, he's the one who's not shy to tell you the ugly side of things, which you need to know it. I, t I do that to my students too, right? Um, uh, obviously, Craig uh, from Fab Lab, um, and uh, obviously Mark Stanley for or coordinating this with all the program committee. I know how much work goes into this. I've been on the other end of it. It's insane amount of work. It will drive you crazy because you'll be sitting on emails and calling phones all the time to, to organize these uh, lecture series. Oops, oops, sorry. And then um, the last thing, um, no, one thing before the last thing. So the Office of Research for the support, the, there's an office actually that
funded a lot of the uh, development of these courses uh, to buy equipment, to record these videos, to buy the software. So I got so many grants that helped me to build this very robust Canvas site. Um, there are people not here in the school, like Clemens. He, he's always sending us free uh, slices for Kramba, which is worth about $40 if you're students and 800 euros if you're not a student. So he'd send us a full version for the past five years that we've been testing out. And then finally, I'd like to thank my research assistants. Some are still here, some are like the previous ones. So Alexander Robinson, Shane Principe, Shane did a significant work in all the topology organization of the wall panels. Nicole Capps, Brian Nocturb is the one we did the competition we went to Germany with. Uh, Nicholas Venson. Nicholas has been, he took all my classes, like in second year and third year, structures, and then he's been my research assistant for the longest time. We did papers together, we wrote figure figures and presentations. He's amazing. And obviously, Kristen Pitts, which like one of the best students and research assistants I've had in life. I also would like to thank my current uh, research assistant. Uh, we haven't done anything together yet. <laughs> But Morgan, uh, Dorothy, Isabel Evans, and Tyler Rowe, thank you for joining the lab. I'm looking forward to uh, do more work with you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, and it's finished. I didn't know how long it would it take. <laughs> so the whole reason I like to paint is that when I put that little a uh, cadmium white dot at the eye of the guy at the end. Before it, it looks that it's lifeless, right? And it's just you put this dot and some highlights and on his cheeks. I think that's what uh, makes it sing at the end, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Trajectory, future. So all I've shown today, just the beginning of things, Majority of these projects is just ideas. It's just starting. We did testing, and we know. I think the next step, uh, which um, I, g I don't know if you guys know, but if, uh, before COVID, I got a residency at Autodesk, and it kept postponing. And now they're open back again. So the hope is that we'll take all these things and test them out uh, in the spring, next spring, on this, in the summer time. That will be a very busy, very very busy time. In theory, we have everything we need here, but they have instead of one robot that we fight over, we have 40. And instead of having, uh, they have very, very advanced machine. And what's nice thing, because I'm a faculty, it's not just one year. I can break it down to multiple uh, summers. So I can go back because I can go to, if I want to do artificial intelligence or AI, then I'll go to Toronto. If I do some robotic 3D printing, then I'll go to San Francisco. And if I want to do some other fabrication, I'll go to Boston. So it's, it's really fun. Uh, so it's only unleashing the beast of design within us. Uh, so I'm building up a team now. So I have three. I need more, actually. So uh, as each project starts to take shape, uh, you might get an email from me till you come, uh, welcome aboard, and let's do some magnificent things. Okay. That's it. Questions? Yeah. Questions? Comments? I'll give a warm-up question. Yes. So you're making some tools. Um, do you have a kind of overarching principle about whether um, that is a kind of healthy paradigm that architecture get in the, in the habit of? We live in a kind of software ecology in which it's harder and harder for architects to make tools. Yes. Do you see that as an imperative, or do you see that as a kind of privilege that some of us have in certain positions in academia or practice? Yes. Yes. This is an amazing question. Did you guys hear Carl? Should I? OK. So it's just Carl is asking about the relationship between architecture and architect and the tools. And now we're becoming in an era where actually sometimes you create your own tools. And actually, we do that every day in classes, right? Like, let's say you're going to copy something 200 times. That's about, if you three click for each one, that's 600 clicks, right? But if you can script that in Grasshopper, that's a small tool. You're creating your own tool. To answer Carl's question, I get that all the time. I actually, I got it 10 years ago. I was on a uh, symposium about um, 
like how architects practice these days and designers and state-of-the-art design, how we approach tool. In SOM, we had something called the black box group, which when the market went down, the half of their firm got laid off, <laughs> and, but except for this group. And they didn't have projects to work on. So they had about two years or a year working on just what are the problems that we faced in the past 10 years and how can we create tools so when we're ready, when we have jobs again, we can actually implement that. So I was actually one of the, the team members of this black box. And then when we got a lot of work, we actually spread them. We put one because these are like the, the ninja warriors, right? So the, each one in, in, a, in a studio. I never like to be labeled something. Like, I'm, sometimes I wear a hat of a designer. Sometimes I wear a hat of a computational designer. Somewhere I wear a hat of a technical architect, some a specifier, even though we had a whole specifier department, specification department. But I think it was my answer to the student. One time a student approached me. I wasn't teaching back then. And she said, can you teach me or tell me all about the tools? Like environmental design, we'll use environmental design, so nobody can come back and critique my design. I would say, oh, it's based on what the tool told me. And I actually made, told her what thing, and then I didn't realize she's going to take it, and, or they're going to take it and make it a code. So I told her, use the tool to realize your design. Never let the tool dictate your design. Don't let the tool, like there was an era where everything looked like Rhino, right? Even the tools we're using now, 99% of the time you see topology optimization, they take it as is and 3D printed as is. No, it just told you where the masses is. You still need to go back, like that chair, we haven't designed the leg of it yet. I, I know where the volume of it, it's like someone gave you a site and you extruded the whole site and said, here's the architecture, because you told me the, bound, the property line is there. And I did this five feet six ba sit back and I'm done, right? No, that's not design. We're replacing the pencil, the ink, the ruler, the T, the, the, the straight edge with these new tools, but they're not a design itself. If you think learning more computational design will save you from being a designer, that's not the reality. It's just going to help you to have a better informative decision as a design, but you still have to design using these tools. They're never, they will never replace your decisions. Even when we did the computation for 99 the, whoever was designed that house, they picked certain prototype. The computer couldn't do it. All of them works, right? But they picked one of them based on their design decision. Out, the tool just helped. So these tools are going to advance, but I don't think it will replace the principle of design, which I believe they're very, very simple, whether you design a door handle. By the way, we designed a custom door handle for Amy, which is inspired by, I never knew that I'm going to design a door handle one day, but the idea is that whether you design a small object or a skyscraper, the three principles are the same. It has to be functional. It has to be very simple. Like when someone sees it, I should have thought of that. It has to be, some people say aesthetically pleasing. I say it, ha I say it has to be aesthetically spectacular and captivating, right? So does that answer your question a bit? So continue learning tool. like. I showed them the other day how we can extract data from satellite from NASA to create our site. And then I, I came to me, a student said, oh, I want to do it in Revit. I said, that's fine. You can see, take the seat. It doesn't really matter. As long as you have a site to design, the site now becomes the problem. It becomes, how, can I, how am I going to do the site? It's actually, the site is just something to get us started to design the building, right? So how you get there, it doesn't really matter. I, that's always in my class, I say. If you want to do it in SketchUp, I can show you how to do it in SketchUp. You want to do it in Rhino, if you, even AutoCAD. You saw what AutoCAD can do. Back then, AutoCAD was modeling boxes. Like, it will make you don't want to even touch the software. So, learn how to push the boundary. Think first, what do you want to design? What do you want to approach? What do you want to reach? And see if your tool is doing it. If it's not, go look for something else or even make your own custom one. Good? Is that good? Very good.
This is an excellent question. Thank you so much. <laughs> I almost had a slide that would show, you know how they have a stealth mode of a car and they have like these textures that you can't know what it is, whether it's a car or a building or something, right? It's just an object or something. I almost put it on it, but it's insanely confidential. So I'm working on something. Like one of the awards that Amy got was like world changing ideas. I'm working on a stealth mode something that's all that I can reveal now. <laughs> that is really going to change the way we work, we live, we, com we, we inhabit things. And that's all that I can say. <laughs> but also, the big trajectory, I think Carl actually touched lightly about it, is that now I, un like I'm, I can do, uh, like this is the first time actually in the studio I'm teaching right now, I'm bringing some of the research in the studio. This, I've never done that before. I do it very, very careful to the level where the students can actually do it because I don't want to overwhelm them. But that's my hope is that some of the work start become applicable and we teach it so people can actually use these skills and techniques and see the full potential of it. But um, my, so now, there's only one building out of the six buildings that I finished designing when I came here that haven't been finished yet. Once that finished, I will feel I'm ready to start designing again. I'm tired only talking about design. I'm not, de I'm not designing. Uh, because I feel it's very important to have the experience in both worlds. And five years is a long time to be outside of that field. Um, it, very, it makes big difference when you describe something to students or teach them when you actually design that and build before. Because the details, the significance of, the, of how you approach the concept, it gets them super much easier. Uh, and I've been super busy, and I'm actually continuing to be even more busy, but I'm excited about the next stage so much, uh, about how can we build upon all what was done in the past five years, and we'll see a newer generation of architects, and we actually start seeing it now. And, and when I go on reviews, uh, we have very diverse, amazing faculty, and the um, quality of the work is just phenomenal. Uh, that has been I progressing and evolving even even before my time here. And we're at the time, we're at the peak of, of our program, I think it's gonna come even higher than that. Uh, we have everything we need to actually not only compete, but to be, we are already one of the best programs, right? But I know we have more, we have more into it. We can do amazing stuff with the resources and the minds and the expertise that we have here. We have a very powerful program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Yes, and I, w I can send you to you. Like, yes. See, again, it's all about the tools, right? It's, uh, it's developed by the Danish Royal Institute of Architects. It's called Top Opt. T-O-P-O-P-T. -O -O it's basically topology optimization. And it's, it's a free app. You can, it can actually 3D print. You can 3D print that shapes that I was just playing with now. You can test out different loads, different uh, supports. You can change the boundary. It's really fun. Play with it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So this one also, you can change the density of the material. It can ask you... How are we going to produce it at the end? Very good. It was not a skyscraper. It was a, a, a downtown. Yeah. It's a very good question. <laughs> a lot of hours. <laughs> a lot of working hours. The idea, actually, it was also my first time to design a series of retails. Like, I designed small cafes, like I designed something called Mint Cafe, which used to have uh, furniture from B&B Italia, Monty's, you guys know, if interior people would know these. There's a very, very, ex like, is that sim think Herman Miller. Um, so, I, uh, and then I've never designed a whole series of retail. That, that We didn't detail the retail, but it has a concept, right? So idea, if you, if you look at that project on the website, 
the idea is start calculating the traveling distance, and every time I feel it passes the point where I need to change the attention of the user, it will create a bridge. And in retail, if you start going beyond the second floor, your retail price drops very heavily because nobody wants to take a stair for a third. So your first floor is the prime one, the second floor. And then once I got that concept, everything else was very easy. But it took me maybe four weeks to come up with this, and then one week to design the whole thing. It's similar to one of the renderings from Amy Images. That's another story. One of the hats, you need to learn rendering, but not to be a renderer. A lot of the project I showed you, these are commissioned renders. It can cost very, very a lot of, like one project will cost like $40,000 just for the rendering. But there will be moments where there's no time, like they released the rendering of Amy with a flower pot and two <coughs> husband and wife standing next to it. That killed the concept, right? Because it doesn't say anything. You think it's a house. But it was not a house, right? It was an energy efficient enclosure thing, right? They, we were just concept. We don't know what the potential application of it. So I had to render it. So it took me five hours to find an image, and then we bought the copyright for it. It took you 15 minutes to render it. This is the one on the mountain that you see. It. The same thing with the one in the snow, with the dog and stuff. So the idea is that um, these concepts, you, you will have to work hard to come up with a strong idea. And then any idea, any idea, that's why I tell my students, any idea, you just, if you develop it, it will be amazing. But just give me something to start with. If you give me nothing, I, I, can't, I can't develop anything out of nothing, right? It's not evolution here, out of water or something, right? Something like that. <laughs> yes? Yes, that's an excellent question. And actually, we got a taste of that. Um, the way we're going to deliver projects, for now, you make a construction documents. The, if you have a specifications or something very customized, the, the contractor or the, the, the manufacturer will make something called shop drawings. This is how we're going to make it. And they're going to send it back to you, right? Through this process, a lot of the design intent could get lost in translation, right? Uh, imagine multiple people trying to fiddle with your design. And it happens a lot in, the, in practice. We're moving towards that now, like even BIM, we have a total legal terms when we put it on the drawings if we share a BIM model. Because now the contractor can actually take this model and think, it's, this is it, and I'm going to construct from it, right? The term CD, or construction documents, it's not really construction documents. Actually, it's called contract document. This is actually part of the contract. Any line you put there, you signed on it. That is the correct and true material. This is how it should be assembled. You are not responsible for the methods and materials. This is the, the contractor side of things. But this start become blurry when you share a digital file. Like I know we keep referring to it because that's the only largest 3D project I worked on. Imagine you're working for six months, you know every curve, you're drawing every surface, and then you walk and you see the full size of it. It's directly from your Rhino model or Revit model. There is a major responsibility now in the architect. We can't say, oh, it was not my mistake, it was the contractor mistake, right? So it's good and bad. It's good that now none of your design intent in the future will be lost in translation, but you're going to have higher responsibility that you make sure there isn't the accuracy of your file. One of the assignments that we did in the current studio, we designed a Lego set for our panels, for a, a prefab panels. So the students were working with details of uh, a house, right? So feet and like a, maybe a quarter of an inch or maybe an inch tolerance, now to a fraction of millimeter. And they were wondering why we're doing that, right? So if you have a stud in your Lego piece, and it's fraction of millimeter. If it fits correctly, then it's detailed correctly. If it doesn't fit, it's not. you mean you model it wrong, right? So later on, the tolerance is the accuracy. Some of the structure models that we use to import from our script to the structure engineers, it has zero tolerance, which is nothing happened in life like that. Because without it, there's structure analysis, sophistic, like a very advanced software. The beams and the line has to meet exactly at the same point. If it's just look like it's there, then it's, it's not going to work. It's going to give you wrong results. So 
I think as we gain more and we try to fiddle with more resources like gaming engine and 3D modeling and scripting and computational design, we now are going to be responsible of how we use these tools and what kind of quality we deliver in terms of the design, right? Because soon it's going to be translated directly from what you're working on. There's not going to be in-between person. Good? Does that answer your question a bit? So there's a little fear and hope in there, you know? <laughs> Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you.